Uh, the standard answer is that um, where you're from is never an easy <laughs> <laughs> answer uh, for for me because I never know where I'm really from. I was born in Taiwan, um, and and even that is complicated, right? So we and, and we won't get into it. Um, so I, I was born in Taiwan. Um, my mother is. Uh, her family's from Taiwan, but my father's family's from mainland China. Mm. Um, and so he he left Shanghai to go to Taiwan, uh, and like a week later, he couldn't come back to China anymore. Um, so that's kind of my family background. And uh, I, I grew up in a in the second largest city in in Taiwan in the south in Kaohsiung. Uh, and I think growing up in the city uh, gives you a very different kind of urban awareness. Mm -hmm. um, um, I, it, back then, at least from what I can remember, it's just you know it, it was a very busy city um, for 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 a child. But but as uh, I remember, even going to my kindergarten, I would walk to school. So imagine a kindergartner walking to school every day, like by herself, and then coming back. And so I think that walk to my kindergarten every day um, kind of formed my a very early kind of urban memory um and and it's about the smells of you know that that's coming from restaurants and these big bowls of soup that people eat and everything kind of spills out to to the sidewalk um that 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 I would walk I, I would walk in um and then when I was about uh 11 12 my family uh, moved to the US and I was in Chicago for my first year and then moved to San Francisco Bay Area. Wow. Um, in terms of architecture, I think it's not until maybe high school. Um, I, I I needed to, you know, select a major for uh, <laughs> for college uh, and really not knowing what architecture entailed at all. Uh, I thought, oh, architecture is quite interesting and perfect because I uh, since young, I've been interested in kind of art and design, but, you know, being from a very traditional Asian family, of course, I think all my curriculum uh, preparation have been more geared towards engineering. Mm -hmm. So uh was, you know, very competent in math and science. So naturally, I thought, oh, okay, so the perfect marriage between kind of art and science would be architecture. And this is where Lyndon came in because I consulted somebody, my sister's friend, uh, who was going to Berkeley architecture at the time. My sister said, oh, why don't you talk to him if you're interested in architecture? And and that was Lyndon. So, oh, so yeah. you're the one to blame. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the rest is history. And, and now it's his turn. <laughs> Did I, I'm curious, so so. When you told your parents that you were going to study architecture, did they have any reservations? Did they say, why not do engineering or something more along those lines? Oh, no. No, no, no. I, I think my parents are uh, com completely open. It was just like, whatever you want to do, what you're passionate in. The engineering part, it wasn't really a pressure from them, but it was that my both my sister, I'm, I'm, the, thir I'm the third mm -hmm. of three children, and um, they both studied engineering electrical engineering, civil engineering. So I think that was like the only thing I knew. And, um, and also maybe being in that being in that environment, and, and the Asian community just kind of, it, it was, it, it seemed to be just like natural. And, yeah. Um, and, and was it was what I was exposed to. Yeah, kind of the default in a way. Mm -hmm. um, and you but you played an instrument or you studied music in, in at Berkeley as well. Yes, yes. Um, it's, it's a funny story because, you know, going through college and, uh, selecting major. And then I noticed that I can actually select a minor. Um, and then I just kind of looked at the map of where Worcester, which is the architecture <laughs> building was and right next to architecture was music. And, you know, Berkeley <laughs> is a very, it's a massive, it's, it's intimidating. Yeah. It's intimidating. And if you have. You know, if you're like going from one end of the campus to the other, you would like be late <laughs> for your class uh, every day. And 
And I just thought, okay, what's the most practical thing to do is to pick something that's close to you. <laughs> and of course, art was close, but I, I didn't do a lot of painting. And, and I've always loved music uh, since growing up, classical music. And so, and, and so I just, I just did it. And, um, and it actually was, was amazing because it, it was kind of a nice uh, break from, you know, uh, the, the very intense kind of design studio uh, courses that Berkeley's undergraduate architecture education was based on. So was your minor in music in performance specifically or theory or something? No, minor, minor was a very general <clears throat> requirement. So you have, uh, you have performance requirement, which uh, I, I play the piano, but I'm not good enough to take a, a performance course. So, so I was in the university choir. Um, oh, cool. And, and, and you had to take theory, composition, um, you know, a, a, a slew of kind of general requirements. That's amazing. I'll say real quick. So when I did a bachelor's of architecture and I played an instrument throughout college, I didn't get a minor in music. I didn't take enough courses to do that. But I can understand certainly having that outlet um, as a pain as it was to abandon studio and go to rehearsals sometimes. Um, it was always well worth it, uh, I felt, for mental health. <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely, absolutely. And and then um, I wrote papers um, mm. that connected uh, music and architecture. So, like, you know, I, I remember, like, one of my history course, I was comparing some something with a, a period, like, a, was it Baroque or... Something between, yeah, a, 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 a stylistic period between architecture and um, and music. And, and that was very en enlightening. That's awesome. That's that's really interesting. It's, yeah, go ahead. I'm a bit curious. Were you like culturally shocked when you went from Taiwan to Chicago? <laughs> I mean, culturally and, and where they're like, too, because they're, they seem to be pretty, pretty different. Was that was that kind of like a weird transition, you know, as a, as a teenager to to do that? Uh, absolutely. And in fact, it was preteen. Uh, so mm. it, the, the weather and all that, I think anything that you expect, um, you kind of prepare yourself for. Mm -hmm. So I remember going from, you know, Taiwan is a tropical place, um, landing in on March 2nd, in oh. the, <laughs> the, the, the middle of like dead winter. And it was like, uh, the day after a historic snowstorm in <laughs> Chicago, um, where I think our, our flight was delayed because of the storm and landed in just like, you know, all white snow <laughs> plain, uh, the Great Plains uh, of, of Chicago. Um, but I think you expect that. So it's it's not as a, a big problem um, because you you prepare yourself you get you get ready for that it was more the the, the cultural side i think mm -hmm. you know going to school um i think the second day it, it was crazy like we landed i think on a saturday and like monday i was going to school uh and <laughs> wow i couldn't speak a word of english i didn't even know the full set of alphabets i knew like maybe a b c d e like up to e i didn't even know pass f so wow. imagine i couldn't speak a word um and and that was really difficult it was it was shocking and at times quite painful you know for for a youngster to it's not even about fitting in but um it's about like kind of losing your identity, not yeah. knowing who you are, because people mm -hmm. don't know who you are, and, and you couldn't communicate. Um, but but I think that first year uh, really, I think, um, prepare me for life, really. Yeah. I think, you know, that uh, going through that kind of hardship, and it was, it was a big shock, right? Uh, and having to maneuver through those difficulties um, really prepare me for, I think anything in life later on yeah i think that's a pretty good training even just for architecture as a profession <laughs> that's a tough transition <laughs> you know, if but, you can survive that then everything's possible and lyndon you also were not born in the united states you were born in the philippines correct 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 i was i was actually born in a very small uh, city called osama city so uh, for most people when they think of the philippines they probably think of manila 
mm-hmm. uh, or Cebu, for instance, uh, if you're into resorts. Uh, I was born <laughs> in a place called Osama City, which is down south. And uh, there were only a handful of Chinese. I, I am a diasporic Chinese. So um, it was really strange because um, at home we only speak Chinese and we go to Chinese uh, churches, Chinese gathering. Um, and it was very important for my parents, um, obviously my grandparents, for me to speak uh, the dialect, not even Mandarin, but the dialect that um, they were from. And so when I was five, I went to Cebu, which is the second biggest city. Mm -hmm. Um, And that was an interesting transition. It was a little bit more rigorous academically. And from there, uh, I left uh, the Philippines when I was 15 for the U.S. In fact, the Bay Area. So we know San Francisco quite well. (laughs) I went to a prep prep school up north, uh, north of San Francisco. Um, And... um, I my I know my my English was better than Rosanna I think when when we started uh when when I no when I landed uh but not that much better um <laughs> I, I kind of know the phrasing but you know I was not from Manila or from Cebu I was from the south um so I I know the language to a certain extent but never really know how to use it uh, right it, it was it was English was really quite broken uh so I I was an athlete, so I used basketball as a way to assimilate to the American culture. Oh, oh nice. Cool. Well, basketball in San Francisco at that time, probably a good way to do it. Yes, and it was an off. I mean, the Golden State Warriors, they were awful. They're not as good as today, <laughs> right? Uh, there's no Steph Curry. <laughs> yeah, there's no Steph Curry. And so people think that, you know, I'm a bandwagon uh, fan, but that's not true. I was I was watching those games when they were world be free and they were so bad and I, <laughs> yeah i was a big fan then and i'm a big fan now <laughs> so uh you came to the u.s to san francisco specifically to study uh, for high school and um it sounds like where you grew up maybe was not a dense urban environment uh no it was it, it wasn't it's a small city uh very village like uh but i was surrounded by a number of my my um grandfather was um you know an amazing calligrapher mm. uh both two of my uncles were architects uh my father oh. was was into uh many beautiful design objects um mm. um he was into furniture business um making furniture um selling them uh, so i grew up in kind of a very um um artistic family even though it was all business related um Mm -hmm. so but i i I knew of architecture early on i think much earlier than rosanna but i had always wanted to be an artist Uh, Mm -hmm. painting painting was my thing i love to draw i love to paint and um so um obviously that was for a chinese family that was a no-no that was absolutely (laughs) not even a consideration uh so i lied to my father um, so when I um, got into um, a number of schools, I actually only applied to one architecture school, or was it two? The rest were art schools, wow. um, or at least art programs in major universities. And my first two years actually at Berkeley, I was uh, uh, I was um, studying art. I was doing painting. Um, it was not only until my father decided to spend more time in the U.S. because he felt like he needed to be with a family that I kind of panicked because I had lied to him all this time. And I was, you know, I, I, was oh, gosh. I, I was actually a mechanical engineering. I was in, you know, <laughs> and you can imagine at Berkeley, you can't just tra- tra- transfer from art um, <laughs> to engineering. So I kind of panicked and um, architecture came in handy. I mean, I love architecture, don't get me wrong, but at that time, you know, I was, I was more idealistic. I really want to just mm-hmm. draw and paint. Uh, so it came in handy and I transferred. Thank goodness I got in. And so when my dad uh, came, I told him that, you know, I actually transferred uh, to architecture without really telling him from where. Right? So he had assumed I transferred from mechanical engineering. And being the businessman that he is, he thought about it and he goes, wow, son, you're really brilliant. It's real estate, isn't it? Meaning architecture, oh, right. real estate, building. And, you know, I just feigned ignorance. By that time, I just, you know, I, I survived. <laughs> 
uh, that pressure. And I'm like, yeah. And he says, oh, that's really responsible of you. <laughs> so I never really told him up until when we were um, inducted into the Interior Design Hall of Fame. That's when the beans spilled because uh, the host talked about our background and said, this, this might be a secret that Lyndon's uh, father uh, or parents have not known all oh. of these times. But by then we were receiving an award. This was what, seven, eight years ago. Yeah. And you know, we were being recognized. <laughs> so by then <laughs> I think all this prejudice of not making it as an artist or even an architect for that matter. Yeah. In fact, that, that didn't matter anymore for a Chinese uh, father. That is too funny. That, that is you know, props funny. to you though for keeping up the uh, charade or however you would describe it for that many years. <laughs> yes, I, I was um, very good at it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you you both were at Berkeley, and that's you know how you met, right? Um, but and I'm looking at my notes here. And you both went on to study and get a master's, uh, but from different schools, I think. Yes. Yes. Rosanna yeah. went to Princeton. I went to the GSC. Um, the graduate school of design at so one of the questions that we do get pretty often so i don't have i have a master's in urban design but not in architecture and one of the questions that i think a lot of listeners have the younger listeners is what would motivate someone to get a master's after doing a four or five year i think berkeley was a four-year degree um, I guess there's a professional license component, but for both of you, was there another factor um, in that decision making, or did you ever think, well, let me just do the four years and then? Because you went to really good graduate programs; they weren't like, you know, hack programs just to get them done to to then get a license. So, what was the reasoning for the masters? Yeah, the the reason for getting in and now looking back, uh, what I got out of it, I think are a a, a bit different. Uh, so I think the the reason for going um, was that first of all it it was what most um, good designers did from from <laughs> Berkeley. So after you graduated four years, uh, you work a few years and then you go to a, a good graduate program. So so it, it was kind of like a, a thing that was charted out for you if you want to stay in architecture later on you want to practice. That's what a lot of people did. Um, and and then it's also a kind of a, a diverse um, uh, education, um, being kind of having having this bicoastal experience. Berkeley, mm. of course, it is in California. It's uh, West Coast, and um, and then a lot of people after Berkeley uh, undergraduate education in architecture would go to the East Coast and one of the East Coast schools um, mm -hmm. for for their masters. Uh, and also because Berkeley is a four-year program, like you said, it's not like Cornell, uh, a five-year program where I think it's uh, it, it would have been okay after a, a five-year program to not do a, a master's. Um, but I think with Berkeley's education, um, it's it it would be more complete uh, to to get a master's after afterwards. But now uh, looking back, I would say. Uh, you know the the balance is is more than just kind of a bicoastal um, experience, but pedagogically, I think uh, Berkeley's Berkeley's architecture education is much more um, intuitive, and it's very kind of uh, formal representation uh, design. You know, hardcore design. Uh, and for me, going from that experience, undergraduate experience, to a school like Princeton, which is um, much less about drawing, but more about uh, writing and speaking and thinking. I mm -hmm. think that really uh, brought my uh, architecture education to a to a completion. Mm -hmm. I see. For, for me, for me, it was a little bit different. Um, I would take summer courses just because I was always, uh, you know, um, interested in studio. I love taking studio, and in fact, when there were I took all the advanced studio at Berkeley, and um, when when I didn't have much choices, I went back back to the art program and did more paintings, uh, because uh, I do like the um, creative aspect uh, of the Berkeley pedagogy, both the art uh, and if if uh, the architecture program did not have it, I would go to the art program to at least uh, kind of relieve my tension and stress. Um, and there were during summers, there were a lot of uh, kids that would come from Colombia 
um, mm -hmm. from Yale um, that would take the summer program uh, at Berkeley. And many of them, uh, I, I still remember um, coming to grips with who Michael Graves was at that time, <laughs> his second year. And he was seen as an, a, a star architect coming to Berkeley. He's filled the, the whole uh, 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 lecture hall was filled uh, with many people. And so I was so intrigued by sort of uh, the difference that the East Coast had to offer. Uh, but more importantly, it was more the idea that Rafael Moneo was, uh, mm -hmm. who became my thesis advisor uh, at Harvard, um, mm -hmm. and his leadership there. Uh, and he was bringing a lot of European architects, who was just absolutely fascinating for me at that time, because I just didn't understand uh, how they approach architecture, let alone how they practice. Um, and so I was really intrigued. So I was following it. And you have to remember, this was before Instagram. I was going to say, what years uh, were you guys at Berkeley, approximately? So, you know, in the late 80s, right? Um, okay. And yeah. so the, it was po before Instagram. So I had to look at papers. I had to rely on uh, word of mouth, people telling us what's happening in the East Coast, uh, talking to professors like Stanley Sadowitz, I, I still remember, or mm -hmm. Mark Mag, and they would tell us, oh, you know, if you want to go to graduate school for diversity purposes, you, you should go to the East Coast. Uh, and these are the different programs and different things. So it made it really, um, for, for me, it was not just about curiosity. I just didn't think I had enough uh, as an undergraduate. It was just four years, and yeah. I, I was just not satisfied. I just said, there's got to be more. And I remember every time there's an exhibition um, that I would see, and, and I was like, wow, how did, you know, I remember seeing the Swiss architects. Herzog de Maron was not a big deal then. Yeah. Uh, the, yeah. I still remember the Jacques Herzog, uh, Pierre de Maron first exhibition. I was just, I hated myself because the work <laughs> was so good. I thought to myself, how can I possibly practice if the world is filled with many good architects? And there's a lot, and sometimes I forget that there are a lot of really good architects there out lot. there. Yeah. Um, there's some bad ones for sure, but there's a lot of really, really good architects, 100%. Um, when you finished grad school, did you feel satisfied, like full, um, or did you still have the sensation that I could keep studying? Oh, I, I wanted to. Um, I had actually... Uh, uh, wanted to apply for um, a program in art history, uh, mm. focusing on Renaissance. Uh, but I still remember my mother coming to me. It's like, mm. <laughs> Legend, I think, you know, uh, we've encouraged you to study, but I think it's about time for you to first um, settle down. And it's important <laughs> for you to be married to Rosanna. <laughs> and very, Ch very Chinese, obviously. And second, I think it's important to start working. You might want to come again later in life uh, if you're interested. Um, and and I think both Rosanna and I, uh, we like to read, we like to travel. Um, and we're always, that's a reason why we're back in school teaching. Uh, Rosanna obviously is heading schools now, uh, mm -hmm. and we'll be heading a school in the U.S. starting next year. But and again, I think that environment is just very much part of our uh, interest and curiosity, but also I, I think very much our DNA. Yeah. And what's go ahead, what's really interesting about you guys, um, aside from the just stunning work that you produce, is that you have managed very successfully to have a very successful practice that does buildings that are great on all the marks, but also you're heavily involved in the academic and education space. And I find that it, that's rare. Um, it's rare to do either of those things, frankly, on their own, but to balance both um, and to have an interest in both. Because I, I, I guess where I'm coming from is I see a lot of colleagues around more my age who love both and they love the education atmosphere, like you were saying, and they kind of get sucked into it. And I find that they end up spending maybe more time than they thought they would doing that and then the, their practice never takes off um but you guys are killing it so so what's the i guess the, the question is what's the secret recipe how did that play out i i think uh, maybe i'll take this rosanna I, yeah. I i think um 
the uh, we're well, first I think maybe we're just naive uh David uh so in many <laughs> ways we just we're so gung-ho and passionate about everything we do and we we feel so blessed to be where we are today uh I don't think both Rosanna and I are any more talented than a lot of practicing architects out there we're just given a lot of opportunity we, we've been in the right place at the right time um and maybe we're also naive in thinking that maybe we can actually change things uh, where we are, and so we try. Uh, so that's one, two. We have very, many very good people. Mm. Um, I credit a lot of the people in our practice. Many of them have been with us over 10 years, and I'm extremely grateful um, for them to be part of what we call our family. Uh, so, so that's for sure. And I think it's um, this um, insatiable curiosity uh, for both of us uh, to always be able to learn, but also to share. Um, mm. You know, we it's always important for us. We, we get a lot of requests for commission. Um, it's easy for us probably to expand our practice to triple the size that we have today, but we, are, we consciously keep it at this size uh, because we're also interested in being able to give back uh, through teaching. Uh, we conduct uh, here in Shanghai, uh, we had this festival of design before COVID. That was the fourth year. In fact, this year was on November 11th, where we bring in um, speakers like David Ajay, Peso Elrich Houston, Ronan Borle, Konstantin Grichik uh, to come and give a lecture. Uh, and it's always for free. And we ask sponsors, uh, be it government and or uh, people in the industry to support this endeavor that we have. Uh, it's nonprofit. Uh, people often say, Lyndon and Rosanna, why are you bringing your competitors to come to a city where you're <laughs> practicing? Um, uh, to, to us, uh, it's just important to bring the conversation and the dialogue, and hopefully if they get work, it's even better because it brings the level of the quality uh, of architecture to another level. Um, so... Uh, a number of things, obviously, uh, aside from those things, um, I, I think it's important to continually teach because by teaching, you're also teaching a group of people that understand your pedagogy. And if they do join you, um, it becomes uh, easier and the transition becomes really smooth. Yeah. Sorry about that. I think one of my Can sons just kind of sneak you... in and open the door. So I... I <laughs> you're yeah, good. Listen, no there's, there's coffee for you. That's why. Um... Oh really? Oh no wonder. There's coffee behind you. Yeah. That was awfully uh, nice of him. Let me let me just lock yeah. the door I, too. But I told him. Nice and, okay. I told him not to go in in case you're recording. But um, can I ask you if yeah. this sound is okay? Because my I think my um, my earphone died. So yeah, no, the sound's coming through. I saw you fussing with it, but it, oh, it sounds so this great. Is fine. Yeah. yeah, it's fine. Okay. Sounds great. Okay. okay. Have, thank, you, have, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rosanna. <clears throat> Um, I think that's a tremendous um, outlook to have for sure. Um, and I've always kind of felt like... Are you secretly grooming your students to like, <laughs> think the way you do? <laughs> that's the plan, right? <laughs> no, frankly, like, like Lyndon said, um, you know, none of it was really very strategic. Yeah. Um, we, we started teaching not thinking we were going to do more of it. I think we first started in, uh, in Hong Kong U. Mm -hmm. And um, this is when 11 years ago. Wow. Yeah, okay. this is when Ralph Lerner became the the dean of Hong Kong U and Ralph was the dean at Princeton when I was there. So, you know, through that, through that connection, um, we started at Hong Kong U. And then I think in the U.S., the first school was Yale. Um, For teaching. That we started teaching, yeah. I think, six years ago. So it, it was all kind of like random and by chance. Um, but now... Of course, now now I'm the chair of Tongji and, and going to Yupen. I think <laughs> now you can't imagine like, you know, not teaching because it's it's become such an important part of not just for us, but part of our practice. Mm. So in fact, we have quite a few senior staff who are teaching in different schools in Shanghai. And and we allow not only do we allow it, we we welcome it. And now when I teach, I have also, a senior staff um, at at Hongji teach with um, teach with us uh, with 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 Lyndon and myself. So, so it becomes a culture mm -hmm. of 
you know, practicing and te- and in fact, practicing is like teaching, right? Like mm-hmm. our the way we run our studio is like is like teaching a, a studio class. Uh, uh, the 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 way we run our practice. So you know, each team they work on different projects, and then we go in, we do design reviews, and so so it's it, it, it's quite it's quite nice that you know people move through those different um, activities seam- seamlessly. I'm so glad you said that because <clears throat> one of the um, I don't know thoughts I've always had was that offices should be run more like studios not in the sense that um i mean some studios are are run really poorly and kind of toxic not in that sense of course but there's some kind of um energy and the way of thinking and the way of working that exists in the um, academic studio setting which i have to say a lot of times doesn't happen in offices and and i think also it extends further than that to where like i've always felt a really good architecture employer is one who's interested in education because it's just your job in a way even if you're not even if you're not teaching a class you have to impart wisdom and knowledge to your uh, employees and everyone in there so there's some kind of you know way of working that is 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 shared and and if i'm making sense yes Mm -hmm. Absolutely. absolutely Yeah, and I feel too, like, you know, like we, that's kind of a topic that comes back pretty often on, on the podcast and through our different platforms from listeners. It's kind of like, again, bridging the gap between the yeah. architecture education, what's happening in school, and then like the profession where, you know, oftentimes this seems like two separate worlds. And I think it makes sense. It would make sense that, you know, as, as David is mentioning, you guys are talking about that employers would kind of encourage this to happen and employees to be participating in the educational, you know, curriculum and, and classes in order to make things change, right? Like, how do we change the education if you're only trying to change it from inside the educational system? And how do you change practice going the other way? I think you're right. There needs, there needs to be more cross-pollination between the two worlds in order for things to evolve in a new direction. Well, let me ask a specific question. When you guys are teaching and, or, and your various exposures to different schools, do you perceive... Uh, that there is a gap between academia and the profession? That's a really good question. I, I never really thought about it. I I think there definitely is. Because uh, when you're teaching uh, in an educational setting, uh, you have the privilege to uh, to isolate different parts of the discipline, mm-hmm. um, but but for the purpose of educating people, right? So so you can't. Mm-hmm. the The reality uh, is the reality of of you know real working life uh, never really enters into the school setting mm-hmm. uh, in 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 its full spectrum. Um, but but that's also. Um, the beauty of it for a practicing, and and that's why I think architecture school uh, is so important for architecture school to have practicing architects teaching, right? Um, and in most schools, they're called professor of practice, uh, and mm-hmm. and usually it's a it's a I think a a, a smaller number of um, professors who are from practice, but in fact, I th- I think that probably should change. Well, mm-hmm. we we need to engage more practitioners to to teach because there's still a disconnect and it's a it's a necessary disconnect. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can't I think you can't let students uh you know get into the real kind of working world uh uh to to teach them um by throwing them into reality uh, too too early on, but at the same time, you need to understand what's involved in the real world too, um, to prepare to be prepared for for that when you graduate. Yeah, that's that's well said. I think it's very very tricky because I think if you were to th- throw at at a, especially a younger student or even a, a graduate student perhaps everything about the real world at them it would it would be overwhelming for sure and i think they wouldn't be able to process the information or they would conform to 
the easiest solution just out of sheer panic, <laughs> you know. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, but, we... But, um... but, but I think it's it's a, a, a hard... That question is a very good question because for our practice, I think the transition from people who uh, uh, graduate and they come to our practice, I think it's easier because I think we're not hardcore professional practice. We are to a certain extent, but one would argue maybe our environment's a bit more academic than usual. Mm -hmm. So we do a lot of research, for instance. Uh, so you can transition into our practice much easier because from school here, slowly you would, it, it, it would not be coming in and immediately goes, well, can you review the shop drawing uh, of this <laughs> sure. uh, FFNP yeah. package or this ironmongery package, right? Sorry, that was an English term. Uh, but um, <laughs> uh, you, you, you're not thrown into that or we do not let that. I mean, we definitely, first, we don't like to lay off people. So we definitely like to uh, make sure that you're in the right spot and given the fact that we're a multidisciplinary practice we also do furniture we do interiors we do architecture uh, and we also have a research component to it uh, so if, if you're a good writer and you can't really draw oftentimes we put you in many different kind of research program uh, that allows you to, to transition slowly our I our goal is really for you to not just assimilate uh, but make sure you enjoy architecture. Mm -hmm. um, and if if you don't, uh, after having going to many different departments, you know, if not architecture, it's product design. If it's not product design, it's interior design. If it's not interior design, we even have a component of graphics and branding uh, that we help other company to help them uh, with identifying their needs and how they structure themselves and how they identify themselves in the market. So there's just a lot of different facets uh, within our practice. and. So in many ways, um, you know, it, it is not hardcore professional architecture practice, I guess. So I guess we're kind of the happy medium between school and, you know, maybe a very you know, efficient, hardcore uh, practice. You have to yeah. be careful what to say. You're gonna, you're gonna have to, you're gonna receive a bunch of applications sure after this do. episode of people wanting to join your office. <laughs> well, I will leave love, California and flood it. We would love that. <laughs> we, we are, we, we actually have have already have received so many applicants. In I'm fact, sure. this summer we we had to call it down. It was hard, and uh, at at the end I felt really bad. But most of them are our students that got in partly because obviously they have first dip, partly because they've been with us. Uh, but it's um. Yeah. So real quick, how big is the office or how many employees? How many people? We have currently about 100 in Shanghai and about oh, wow. 15 in 15 in Europe. A hundred you know, going across 100, in, Sh 100 okay. in Shanghai and 15 in, uh, in in Europe. So we're about 115, 120 actually. That's pretty today, good. So. I what? mean, that's not small. So one yeah. of the things that always amazes us is that you never know obviously just on base just based on people's work and their profile how big their office is and no. i mean you guys are turning out these, like, tiny little projects right and they're yeah. like wow how do they survive <laughs> <laughs> we're considered actually in china we're considered a very small practice oh. we're competing against practices with uh we're not even shortlisted on a lot of the more cultural project just because we don't have the numbers, unfortunately. We don't have 400, 500. You know, the ones that Herzog de Moron competes, mm -hmm. um, we can't even be part of because we don't have the three. I mean, Kengo Kuma, yeah. you know, they have 300. Herzog is more than that. So it's easier for them to compete on those bigger scale cultural projects. Because we're not all, we don't do only architecture uh, and interior, but, but there's a big component of industrial design um, and and then also graphic design. So. You know, um, I think compared to other architecture offices, we have we have a, I would say about we have about fifteen people who are in um, product and and graphics. Interesting. Okay. okay. So I'm I'm a bit curious. I don't know if you know about our graphic design or our um our product design life. We <laughs> know. <laughs> We know because it, it, it depends, right? Some people like they actually know us only as like furniture lighting designer. <laughs> they don't know about the architecture. We, we, um, yeah, yeah, we know both actually. We know we your know lighting, both, but, we know your furniture. But but I, I will say obviously we're architects and we have a lot of architecture friends, so therefore 
we collectively know you guys as the architects first and foremost, but right. there are a lot of offices who claim to have a, what is it, multidisciplinary practice, but in yes. fact, that's not like really the case, but you guys truly have that. Yes. Actually. We, uh, and there are like different department or yeah, different teams mm -hmm. and um, teams who are trained differently. And, and this is, this happened, I think, very early on when we were taking first, it started with interior projects that needed uh, custom, custom furniture. And we, I don't even remember like how it started, but, you know, we had one or two staff who were trained as industrial designers. And then we realized, wow, working on, you know, furniture design with them um, is, is such a different experience from um, working as as an architect uh, designing furniture because mm -hmm. we come from you know Michael Graves office and obviously I think that lineage uh, really influences us and that's why we dabble into industrial design and yeah. uh, but in Michael's office he uh, there there's a mix I think there there are people who are from industrial design um, background and then there are people who are from architecture background and and it's a great uh great synergy uh how we support each other uh the the industrial designers they are taught to uh work with intricate details mm -hmm. and their knowledge on material is very different from our knowledge on you know material because we're we're mostly building material sure. but i think architects have a, a very strong innate sense of structure uh, and I often, you know, every time I'm reviewing like a new chair design or a, a new uh, table design, I'm telling our industrial designer, like, this is way too thin. It's not going to stand. And sure enough, like, you know, the prototype <laughs> is back and it's like wobbly. But I think because we, um, we work with our hands so much as architects yeah. and we're always, you know, looking at buildings and it's all about structure um, we have a very good sense of what will stand and, and, and what won't. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, so it's it's always good to have that balance. And our architects, if we have a project that we do architecture and interior, uh, then we get the industrial design team in for the furniture um, aspect. Then, then the discussion is really interesting because, you know, there are people from three different backgrounds mm -hmm. talking about one design and, and and you can see how um each team support each other that's a lot of fun that's really interesting mm -hmm. so what is the the approximate split between those different disciplines within the office is it like a 50 50 is it like mostly oh, architecture no, no. Like... it's mostly architecture okay um <laughs> yeah um no, and... we have um we we have uh um here i have the breakdown um, <laughs> the specifics <laughs> We, we actually have about 52 architects, uh, trade architects. We have about 27 uh, interior architects. We call it interior architects because they are uh, trained in um, either architecture school, but they focus in interior design, mm -hmm. yep. um, you know, programs from St. Martin's or uh, RCA. Uh, and then we have seven, six, sorry, six product designers and the rest uh, are part of administration. Gotcha. Well, that's a okay. pretty good yeah. team. Interesting. So uh, going backwards <laughs> a little bit. I didn't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, going backwards a bit. Um, so you guys both did school on the East Coast. You both worked at Michael Graves office. I am very, yes. I'm very curious yes, I did. What, what that experience I, I, was like. For, for me, it was a good experience. I was there for 10 and a half years. Uh, wow. Oh, wow. Uh, I became an associate. I became the director of projects in Asia. Um, and so that was really a lot of, uh, Michael was an amazing uh, uh, mentor. Um, and I think uh, it was extremely international. Uh, we were traveling a lot, uh, working in different parts of the world. Um, and as Rosanna said, it was extremely multidisciplinary. Yeah. Um, you know, we were, even though we were not technically involved in the products team, we see it. Uh, we see the graphic component of it. Um, we design some things, you know, chairs, and of course we would forward it to the product team to make sure that actually it works um, uh, within the practice. And, and some of us that 
uh, managed to do interiors, also did uh, a number of furnitures. Um, granting they were not part of Michael Graves collection, it was just beca it became kind of a total whole. Um, so it was um, uh, an energized uh, environment. And he was also teaching at Princeton. Mm -hmm. And um, we would invite it, or some of us would be invited to reviews. Uh, Michael actually had invited me to a number of reviews. And there were a number of people, I still remember Aldo Rossi coming to the office, <laughs> like with me, you know, opinion, you know, Peter Fiddler, Eisenman. Yeah, yeah, Peter Eisenman coming to the, the office. Five whites. And, you, and, and you would get picked, you would, uh, projects would get picked. And Michael goes, London, bring that project uh, from Shanghai that we're working on. And then, you know, go go ahead and present and let's see what Peter have to say. And like, oh, man, <laughs> it's crazy, really crazy environment. So it was really chaotic. Um, and Michael and I really bonded uh, because he loved sports and I did too. Uh, so I used the time at night to actually um have uh reviews and crits <laughs> yeah so i got coming i come back to the office maybe at around eight o'clock and wait for him work a little bit and by 10 30 he'd show up he'd be watching baseball or basketball game and that's how i would um get my work done by kind of showing him the work uh and talking to him about sports so that's that was amazing. really a great environment for me <laughs> how did the uh, presentations to eisenman go no, it was brutal, you know. It was it was always loaded. Peter has always had uh, a motive, and you know it's it was never, um, you know, he was always questioning. There was a lot of good bantering between him and Michael. Um, you know, with uh, with Aldo Rossi, uh, you know, it was always interesting because he was always have new magazine clippings. He would take them out, <laughs> and he's like, "Look at this mood board." Uh, before mood board, he would show us uh, images of. Uh, you know, magazine clippings that he's seen from fashion magazines as inspiration. It was really interesting, different ways of looking mm. at things. But um, uh, it was really uh, an interesting time, interesting uh, place to be, I think, at that time. So was that the... Was over 20. I was just going to say, so was the work being done in the office classified as postmodern? <laughs> you mean, you mean, you mean Michael Graves? Yeah. You know, it's interesting. You, you should ask that question because... Um, there was this article that came and says the king of postmodernism, right. uh, Michael. And I remember being interviewed in Korea. Um, he was being interviewed and he says, Michael, uh, what do you think as the king of postmodernism? How do you deal with your legacy in terms of you being part of the New York Five? Right. And um, he said, you know, I'm actually not really interested in any of these categorization. I think that's part of the job of the press and mm -hmm. for people out there. Um, I might have changed. Um, certainly I did, uh, but I'm more interested in being considered a good architect. That's a great uh, and answer. I hope I, I hope I will be one uh, when the time is over and my, my time here on earth is over and my work is done. I want to be seen as a good architect. Um, I might have changed. Um, things might have happened uh, contextually that led me to do a certain um, articulation, uh, be it form, uh, or typology, or uh, I guess the, you know, one would say style. Uh, but I thought that was a very good answer. And that's that's, he, a, that's he, a fantastic answer. Yeah. <clears throat> we uh, we had Denise Scott Brown on the show, and I had to ask her if, which I kind of didn't want to ask, but I felt responsible. I had to if she if I if she felt that postmodernism still had a role um, in today's society, and she was like, first of all, I'm a modernist. <laughs> I was like, okay. <laughs> um, um, so uh, you both were at Graves, and then did you together launch the practice that you have currently right after working at Michael Graves' office? And what led to the decision to start your own practice? Okay, long story short, um, <laughs> we were uh, asked, uh, or I was asked uh, to run a project here in China uh, by a client. Well, the client had wanted a project manager um, or requested from Michael to have a representative from the office. And uh, one thing led to another. And ultimately, what he really wanted was my presence here in Shanghai. And I said, no problem, but I think... Um, you know, it's important that my family is with me. Uh, Rosanna just gave birth to Zachary, our youngest, uh, at that time. 
He's now 20, so that was 20 years ago. Wow. Uh, he was four months old, and I made it very clear to the client, if you want me, you need to bring my whole family. Yeah. Uh, and it was a six weeks exercise. So I thought at that time, you know, perfect kind of uh, break. Uh, my kids were not going to school then, or when, if they were, the oldest was five. Uh, it was, you know kindergarten mm -hmm. uh and and i thought to myself or we thought to ourselves maybe it's a good break well we came um and sars hit after uh, the fifth week so we oh. couldn't really go back and the client was really happy that i was here because the pro project was progressing so they agreed to continue paying michael graves to have my presence here uh and that became three months. After three months, they got used to it. Now we could go back to uh, the U.S., but they kept asking for my presence to be here. So we stayed three months, turned into six months, six months, turned into nine months, nine months, turned into a year. And by the time the project was was done, I, I saw the energy here in Shanghai. And I saw so many factory making uh, factories, uh, European uh, brands that made their furniture here in China. Mm -hmm. And I thought to myself, well, this is interesting. So I proposed to the office that perhaps we can have an office um, in Shanghai. Um, and, you know, I proposed it to Michael. He was really excited. I said, you know, Michael, maybe I should not be traveling anymore or traveling like mad. I have three kids. Uh, why don't I have an office here uh, in in uh, Shanghai and maybe also have a small retail store and you, know, you can sell some of your products here. Uh, it'll be a satellite office at Michael's office. Um, and so that's how um, it started. But I think uh, during that time, uh, it was not the office's plan to expand. I can understand where they're coming from, um, mm -hmm. let alone if they were to expand maybe to Europe, but uh, maybe not so much in Asia. Um, and so um, I realized that, you know, that was going to be very difficult to convince uh, all the partners, Michael had partners at that time, mm -hmm. uh, to just spend, it will be a cost center, right? Yeah. <laughs> to yeah. spend so much money uh, uh, for a place um, here in Shanghai. Um, and so I realized that maybe that was just not a possibility. And so Rosanna and I talked about it and we said maybe uh, it's time for us um, to move back to Asia. And it was important for us that the kid speaks uh, Chinese. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, this would be the best place, right? I mean, I never really thought of moving here. That was not my intention. Um, so, yeah, I went back uh, and uh, uh, tendered my resignation. That was very hard, actually very hard after mm -hmm. 10 and a half years. Um, yeah. I love that place. Uh, Michael was uh, an amazing man. Uh, I worked for a number of people. I worked for this principal called Tom Rowe, who really supported me uh, throughout my tenure there. He was extremely brilliant. Um, um, and a number of other principal, people like Karen Nichols, uh, Patrick Burke, um, many of the people who are still at Michael Graves today. Uh, and they, they've been um, very supportive of uh, my time there and it was hard it was very very hard we didn't have any work we didn't have any <laughs> uh, projects so we just uh decided why not uh the, for the sake of our kids and for the sake of and, and it was also important for me that um that rosanna um uh, have this opportunity or at least have a choice to be able to uh work and uh, be at home or have some help here in Asia. Right. Um, and that's what we did. Uh, we moved our three kids, uh, came to Shanghai for the first six months. We didn't really have any work. Uh, so <laughs> that, was, that was pretty crazy. That's pretty bold. And, uh, yeah. Looking <laughs> back, we thought to ourselves, looking back, oh, I think we're just fortunate that God was good to us. <laughs> well, as you said, it's the power of being naive. Um, it's yes, the best yes. sometimes. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, th I think, um, Lyndon, you know, we we decided to live, well, we wanted to be in Asia. We wanted, and then um, our experience in Shanghai was so great that we didn't want to leave Shanghai. So that was really, that was the key reason, rather than saying, oh, we want to establish our own firm. It wasn't like that at gotcha. all. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, but we, no. we came to Shanghai and we just, we saw how the kids were, you know, my, the, like, they were speaking to each other in Chinese. And I was like, wow, this is, this would never happen 
if they uh, had been in Princeton, right? So um, we just wanted to, and I don't know if you remember your first question, like, you know, how, like my background, my father uh, went to Taiwan from Shanghai. Mm -hmm. So for me personally, mm -hmm. it was like coming full circle. Now mm -hmm. I'm bringing my kids back to Shanghai. Um, and so that first six months to a year was amazing. We wanted to stay. And like Lyndon said, we had no idea what we're going to do. <laughs> <laughs> um, and after a few months, like there was one project that came and, uh, and then, we, and then we actually first worked on products. So we were doing, you know, product design and then we designed like teacups and <laughs> glasses Cool. <laughs> and, and that, that became kind of like the first, um, the, the beginning of Design Republic, which was the, which was the first company that we registered before we did anything in architecture or interior. So we did spoon and forks, <laughs> uh, cups and plates. Uh, and I remember Rosanna coming, it was a small dining table and Rosanna said to me, L Lyndon, you know, you, we can't feed our kids based on your, all your drawings. <laughs> you know that, right? <laughs> Six months into the thing and, um, and so I, I said, yes, I know, just be, be patient, let's be, you know. And so I compiled a portfolio and instead of looking for work, I was crazy enough to approach a number of investors and said, and I approached them and said to them, look, what if, what if, what if we can have a brand coming out of China? What if there are product designs that are authentically from Asia. What if we bring the best of the world's product so we don't copy them to China and hopefully one day bring the best mm -hmm. to the world? What if, just so many what ifs. And we were so surprised, you know, after approaching how many Rosanna? Six, I think seven, six were in, really interested in this idea of made in China, authentically from China, <laughs> and wow. also have this dialogue and all this. And we were so so flabbergasted you know we didn't even know how to do a structure and you know company structure and i remember the first investment that came into our portfolio was not for architecture at all it was purely for products and i still remember looking at the our bank account and rosanna and i look at each other and rosanna goes what did you tell them for them to have that kind of money in the bank account and then all of a sudden we're like oh my god i kind of I was confused at that time. And I'm like, what should we do? So we actually hire ourselves two assistants. Uh, that was, they were the two hires, the first two hires. Uh, and um, it just went from there. Um, one thing led to another. And, um, you know, for the first two years, it was Design Republic before Nair and Who. Um, oh. 2004 to 2006, we were actually known as the founders of Design Republic. Right. Uh, here in China, first and foremost. And it was only much later, after we finished our architectural project, which is Waterhouse, seven years into our first foray into uh, our own practice, did our architecture uh, practice uh, took off. Um, you know, we were doing a lot of interior design uh, yeah. two years after we came to Shanghai. Yeah. yeah. That's a great story. It's interesting. Yeah, so I'm, I'm wondering too, like I feel like, there is a lot of modern design kind of across the disciplines that I feel like is being in the press over the past few years coming from Asia. Was modern design and modern architecture like starting when you guys moved to Shanghai or was it kind of like not really popular then? Hmm. Um, I, I think there was a period of time when uh, China was really close. So I, I actually think China missed a big component of the postmodern period and the deconstructive period. Yeah. I think it went from, you know, 1930s, 1935, 1940, and then all of a sudden jumped into uh, the modern period. Uh, but it was not very mature. Uh, so as long as, you know, people were seeing new things, they were building things. But, you know, what was really nerve wracking was they were demolishing buildings at a rate that was unprecedented. So mm -hmm. we were really concerned. Oh. So we were at, at that time when we were practicing, we were not even thinking of new buildings, to be uh, to be to be honest with you, uh, Marina and David, we, we were just trying to save the city that we were in or we wow. were practicing. And so our conviction was, look, let's keep as much of the old buildings. Okay. 
because we we didn't even have time and we were just like why are people just building high rises and and obliterating all this beautiful neighborhood at rate that was unprecedented and you know my kids would go to an ice cream uh, shop and then a week later that would be gone wow. and that was really disturbing for us and that's the reason why you know our first three projects the water house the split house uh design republic flagship stores uh were really about old and new about reusing recycling mm. uh taking on old buildings and taking a strong position with the government by saying it can work mm -hmm. we can uh, take one old building and make it uh, come alive again. And I still remember talking to one of the government officials and I, you know, being Chinese, I know exactly what would trigger them. And I'm like, you know, you have grandmothers, right? Do you just discard them because they're old? And that really, <laughs> that bothered him. That question really bothered him because you have a very good point. You know, I said, do you just constantly have babies and not deal with your grandparents? And, you know, are you going to be completely disrespectful and bring, uh, put them in, uh, you know, places of like hospices and, I think that really bothered him yeah. and that made him think and he goes, you know, you have a very good point. And um, so for uh, the first few years of our practice, we focus on a lot of old and new and mm -hmm. we hardly had any like from ground up project. I mean, that's a very recent thing. Maybe that was five years ago. We start doing ground up work just because people were asking us to do it. And that's a pretty interesting question in terms of design. I mean, I feel like, you know, the maybe the U.S. doesn't demolish cities and building as fast as, you know, maybe China used to do it. But there is kind of um, a, a sense of consumerism in building homes in the U.S., which is extremely wasteful. And I think in a way it kind of, you know, avoids the question of having to deal with something that's existing, right? You just erase it and start blank and yeah. it's just a bit easier and more freedom. Um, so the, the idea of reusing what's there and transforming what's there in a way that could you know serve a more contemporary purpose or lifestyle i think is a, a really a really good question it's something that maybe um, you know should be brought to the table a bit more often these days i feel like yeah i mean china is no different from the rest of the world there's a sense of commodity mm -hmm. uh so when uh, when 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 a particular aesthetic uh, or style for a lack of better description uh, becomes popular um you know, there is then this whole uh, commodification process, right? When, you know, Zaha Hadid um, became the thing, a lot of young architects tried to do that. And you can kind right. of see a lot of work. And it's really unfair to Zaha because I think Zaha is a good architect and like the work that is being produced is amazing. But there's a lot of copy that just becomes so yeah. commodified yeah. and really mediocre at best. When Wang Shu won the Pritzker here, uh, if you go see his uh, project in, in Hangzhou, it's amazing. Right. But then a lot of young architects or a lot of developer look at that and goes, well, if that made him famous, then, you know, maybe our development should also have that yeah. type of yeah. uh, architecture. So it, it, this commodification is a very dangerous uh, phenomena uh, and it happens everywhere um, around the world. And because China is building so fast, um, you know, you just see exponentially a, a bigger chunk of that uh, scene uh, in 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 this country i do sometimes wonder if that is happening and this is pure speculation is happening more frequently because now images are so easily shared versus the days of what you're saying you had to open a book and like study and and you had to take time to 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 find the thing but now there you know on instagram for example we you see so many images that i think it sometimes leads to a lot of kind of superficial copy catting. Yeah, and no, absolutely. Not, that, that will just, that will get worse with, with AI assisted, um, computer generated <laughs> images. <laughs> it, yeah, oh, be yeah, yeah. In the future. Yeah. Uh, and also on that note, then question for you both. So when did you feel like w with your practice that you found your voice and your own way of architecture i'm trying to avoid the word style here <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. that's a notorious for hating that word um <clears throat> or oh, you still find trying to find it mm -hmm. i mean i i think i think it's a constant 
um, exploration and that process is ongoing. So it's always work in progress. Was there one project um, to date where when it was completed or maybe when just design phase uh, phases finished, you felt like this is this has started to get at what just it resonates with who we are and what we're trying to do? I, I think it, it was more of of the condition of a place where we are. So when we finished Waterhouse about 11 years ago, uh, that was a very strong position. Uh, it was also a culmination of that time and mm. place. Uh, where we are uh, and how we um, handled that situation where a client wants us to demolish an old building and we took a strong position to keep it. Um, and that led to other projects that allowed us to explore those issues. Um, so, you know, oftentimes we are formed by the condition that we are in um, and how we respond to it. Uh, and I think that was one of them. Um, and I think many of the projects uh, led to many of the newer projects uh, started from that. But I think we're still developing. I think um, we're, we're too young to understand <laughs> yeah. uh, our, our position. Uh, we, we, Rosanna and I always like, uh, you know, Saint Exupery, um, mm -hmm. one of his quotes, he says, we do not uh, aspire to be eternal beings. We only hope that things do not lose its meaning and purpose. We're always trying to find purpose and meaning in our work. And, um, you know, I, I, I love what Rosanna said once, uh, she said, you know, I said, Rosanna, when are you going to stop being or stop doing architecture or being part of this process? And he's like, when I'm no longer, when I'm, I can't contribute anymore, um, I, I will take myself out. Uh, I, I thought that was really uh, a good statement. Uh, Architects are uh, such uh, 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 I know. hardcore people at heart, really. Yeah. yeah and, you know, we, we talked about music um, mm. and I, I always... I always feel that maybe from the very beginning, like one of our first product uh, design um, project was our Zisha, our um, purple clay tea set uh, and tea, tea cups and teapot. Uh, and then one of our earlier earliest architecture work was uh, Waterhouse. I feel like that, that, you know, those DNA and a few representation, not style, uh, mm -hmm those those early earliest projects um really already represent us as designers and uh and it's almost like you know if you think about music um the composition has been done hundreds of years ago but today you can still you can still play bach and and chopin or or beethoven and and make those pieces relevant uh mm. in in our contemporary context. And, and I think with each project, we will take on, you know, things within our DNA and um, interpret them according to the contextual kind of specificity of, of each project. You know, also D David and Marina, yeah. we, we actually don't have an answer. In fact, we're always questioning. <laughs> That's why I asked I'm, the question. I'm, I'm, yeah, I, I, reminded, I, I was reminded of uh, a reading we had. In fact, this was in our exhibition in Berlin, uh, the French philosopher Jean uh, Baudrillard uh, mm. in the book Ecstasy of Communication. Uh, he quoted, you know, we are living in a world where sexuality is superseded by pornography meaning we're more interested mm -hmm. in por por uh, pornography than the intimacy of sexuality. We're uh, more interested uh, in information than knowledge. Uh, we're more interested in object as opposed to subject. Mm. And that, we, you know, terror is rep uh, uh, rep replacing violence. Um, so, so for us, I think we're more interested in sort of the uncertainty mm. uh, in, in our edit, edit, uh, uh proposal we wrote that you know we propose a condition of uncertainty uh, a condition of experimentation uh, perhaps a condition of humility and understanding that it's okay to be primitive and primordial uh, it's interested to be interested to be on the third space to be blurry mm. uh, perhaps it's not so straight the line is not so straight and not so efficient uh, perhaps not so uh, legible 
uh, but the goal is is the same, right? To be able, as Lena Boeing coined it, to be able to go home and eventually heading home to understand who we are, and by only understanding who we are, can we contribute back uh, to a, a broken world? It's it's interesting because I I feel that architects have a very unique in some ways, but but special role because it's it's our job to to be kind of facilitators or, or to take in all this information and to respond to it and to be flexible and to be open and, and all the things you've described. But it's, it's you know, you're also a person authoring something. And so I, I just personally find that the the question or the subject of the, the, on the one hand, having continuity throughout work, that's not forced continuity, but is somehow, I don't know, natural, I suppose. But meanwhile, every project is different because of the circumstances is a, uh, Sometimes it feels like a tension uh, between the two that, I don't know, it's something I'm always thinking about in the back of my mind. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But anyway, <laughs> um, is is most of your work <clears throat> in Asia or is it scattered across uh, other countries? Well, it started uh, mostly in China, as you would imagine. Um, I think maybe around 12 years ago, it started to become Asia. Uh, works in Hong Kong, Taiwan, Korea, and uh, I think the last five years things have changed dramatically. So fifty percent of our work is now outside of China. Wow. Um, we have a lot of work in Korea, uh, Taiwan. Uh, we're starting a project in Japan, starting a project in Bangkok, uh, a project in Singapore, and now we have quite a few projects in Italy, Paris. Uh, and the U.S. and also South South Africa, uh, so things have gone uh, global on our end, not by choice really, but um, I think I think some by virtue of competition and others um, interesting programs and typologies that we were interested in exploring. For so for all of the projects, are you able to be the architect of record or or executive architect for the ones in? Asia, how does no. that work? No, we always have an architecture of record. Okay. Uh, we always have a local architect. I think that's very important for us um, because we need to be informed of the local condition. I don't think we're, we always assign during uh, construction, have someone from our office, one or two. Um, we have uh, people on the ground. For instance, in Taiwan, we have three people. In Korea, we have two. Um, you know, Italy, we have a satellite office there. We have four people in Paris. We have four, uh, in London, we have three. Um, so there's always people on the ground, um, so that they can uh, have, um, conversation or, um, mm -hmm. you know, communication with a client, but at the same time during construction phase, it's important imperative for us, aside from our local architect to have, um, a representative from our office. Um, gotcha. But for the local projects, are you guys operating as the local architect or you typically partner with somebody in china uh, yeah. we have no choice because in china unless you have a local design institute you uh, it's a government uh, regulated what we call ldi and all the firms needs to partner with an ldi so we always have an ldi Interesting. Uh, working with us mm. Interesting. didn't know that yeah. all right Even i know local chinese design <clears throat> architects uh -huh. uh, they all have ldi mm. Fascinating. I know we're running out of time. So the final question, which is sometimes the most difficult one for each of you, is what is your favorite building? Oh, my God. <laughs> huh. I haven't been asked that question in a long time. <laughs> well, that's a tough question. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't know if I can answer that question. Can yeah. we? Do you have another? Yeah, I have. I have another. You have another. Okay, have well, another. just stay on it because you have to answer the question. That's part of the game. <laughs> I have another. So you guys, you guys met in school or about to start school? Did you used to work together in school, like when you started in, in at Berkeley, or did that kind of start a little bit later? And oh, also, that's a good question. And, and and who's the best designer out of you two? <laughs> <laughs> it's a very good question. Um, you know, I, I came to architecture two years after Lyndon, right? So okay. when he was a senior at Berkeley, I was a freshman. So of course he was like my mentor. He came to my studio and helped me, uh, 
with so many things. Um, yeah, so I I would say like in school when we worked together, it was Lyndon helping me on my project. <laughs> <laughs> and then of course I would I would go to his studio and I would help him with like building models. Of course, I was like the working bee, you know. I, <laughs> Help <laughs> <Just like laughs> yeah. Rosanna is being humble. I, I think what, what happens is I, I think the great thing about our partnership is the fact that um, uh, for, first, obviously, um, you know, I'm, I'm a God fearing man. So I believe that God prepared Rosanna uh, for me and vice versa. Uh, we're really fortunate to be uh, with each other. Uh, I think Rosanna keeps me grounded. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a dreamer. So I often I'm kind of um, delusional uh so i i tend to just uh ignore clients and i tend to think that everything is possible uh rosanna is an amazing critic an amazing critic um and she thinks very clearly uh very um and i guess princeton also helped her achieve all that extremely methodic methodic uh in terms of methods uh but um um you know um I tend to just, I tend to draw and Rosanna tends to think uh, with design. I tend to draw and we, we, it's not that she doesn't draw and I don't think, but um, that uh. is our priority. <laughs> uh, so, so we're very, we're very different. Um, and, you know, I'm not very good. Uh, Rosanna is more accurate with public relation, clarity on explaining. I'm not interested once the project is over. I would often tell the media, why don't you ask the same question when you just look at the building? Um, <laughs> so I'm more interested probably in business development because I want new project. As you yeah. can imagine, if you ask Rosanna, who's the best architect or, or you know, I have a, a property in uh, Portugal um you know who do you think should be the designer rosanna would probably say you know the first choice would probably be alvaro Siza, and the second <laughs> would probably be soto de mora and then if you can't get them maybe aris mateos you know <laughs> if you ask me that same question i will think for about two minutes and said maybe you consider us <laughs> and you know and maybe the second choice would be rosanna third choice would be linden i'm just i'm very practical that way but i want to do everything and rosanna doesn't want to do anything <laughs> i mean if it's up to her she the the uh, studio would probably be just three people and, one project. <laughs> and you know if it's up to me it'd probably be studio would be 300 people so i mean i think it's good um it's good partnership and it's been an amazing ride to be together with her uh all these years yeah. uh it's good, it's, it's good really balance. crazy yeah <laughs> was there was there as uh, you, you were making us laugh because we work together marina and i and we are together so there are some parallels i'm sensing yeah, I know. uh for sure yeah. um i tend to be very ambitious and she's oh, like what the yeah. are you talking about <laughs> <laughs> why do you keep being in check you know um, uh so i know you guys are running out of time so but you gotta answer the question of favorite building <laughs> or, or maybe not favorite, but maybe one building that you felt like moved you, sure. you know, emotionally when when you saw it or when you visited it. Well, there was this moment of um, driving down from San Francisco to uh, San Diego to or La Jolla to mm. to visit the Salk Institute, and you, uh, I, I went with a few of my uh, friends who were going to architecture school with me. And it was our first time seeing Louis Kahn. Mm -hmm. And you park your car and then you kind of like walk up the steps and like that moment of seeing the Pacific Ocean being framed by the building, that was just like an unforgettable moment. And and it kind of reassured why you're in architecture. And, mm -hmm. and so I think, you know, we have many such moments um, from, from that point on, there are other buildings uh, from Le, Cou Le Corbusier to, I don't know, I can't think of a, uh, Mies van der Rohe. So, um, but but that was like a defining moment for, for me. I, I, th I think for me, it's a hard question just because I think there's a lot of good buildings out there, but uh, mm -hmm. I remember looking at the chapel by Leverance uh, in Stockholm. I was really moved by the gravity and the strength of one singular material mm -hmm. and how you can carve with one unit and make it one whole. Um, I was also really, when I saw the swimming pool and the Syrovs, 
Museum, but especially the housing project by Alvaro Siza. Uh, that really changed the trajectory of how I thought of space. I mean, I was taught by Rafael Maneo, so I, I would have already known that um, theoretically. But what really moved me one building, if you were to really think, is uh, the the school um, in Omnibad by um, Louis Kahn. Mm. Uh, I still remember having seen Le Corbusier's work, the mill's owner, and I thought it was really, really good. I thought no building could top that. Then I went to, is it called IIT, uh, Management Institute, uh, by Louis Kahn in Omnibot. I still remember um, staying there for maybe five hours. Wow. And I said to myself, this is absolutely <clears throat> crazy. I left that place and told Rosanna, I said, I'm going to stop being an architect. This is just way <laughs> too good. <laughs> he did this you yeah. know, 40, 40 years ago. Yeah. What are we doing? What are we doing? Yeah. This is so good. And Rosanna felt the same way. But of course, when we left the premises, it took me about an hour and I saw the buildings around me. I'm like, okay, maybe I should say that. <laughs> There's a lot of work to do. There's a lot of bad architecture. Yeah. Uh, but th there are a lot of moments like that that made me think really, wow, architecture is so powerful. Um, and yeah, we're blessed. We're blessed to be, to be in this profession where we're actually paid uh, to do what we love. Uh, we're extremely, extremely blessed. Those are great answers. Uh, this was a, a lot of fun to speak with you both. Um, thanks for making the time. It's time to pack for you so you can <laughs> fly and to Macau or whatever's next. Um, but so we appreciate it a lot. No, thank you. Thank, thank you, you both. Great, yeah, and... great questions. And Hi, everyone. Thanks for watching this video on YouTube. If you like what we're doing, then please support our show by hitting that subscribe button and liking and commenting on our videos. You can also find us on most of the social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We're mostly on Instagram. And you can reach out to the hotline, 213-222-6950. 213 <laughs> you can send a text message or leave a voicemail if you have any reaction to this recording, any questions you might have, or guest suggestion, feel free to send it our way. Cool. Thank you for watching, and see you next week. Thanks. Bye-bye.